Welcome to Selecting the Ideal Data Structure, Data Records, and Sets. My name is Chris, and I will be your guide. In this course, you'll learn about common abstract data types that are used in Python, specifically records and structs, and sets. A quick note, all code samples here were tested using Python 3.9. Most of the concepts have been around for quite some time, so if you're using an earlier version, you shouldn't run into any trouble, and I'll do my best to point out any version differences as I go along. An important part of designing and coding your program is figuring out how to store your data and how to organize it. Different kinds of data structures have different strengths and weaknesses and purposes, and choosing the right one will affect how easy it is for you to code as well as how performant your code will be. Python likes to think of itself as a batteries included language and as such comes with most of the common data structures that you could possibly need. This course focuses on two of those types of data structures. The first is data records and the second is sets. A previous course on data structures covered dictionaries and arrays. A link to that will be in the notes below in case you wanted to check it out. This course is divided off into two sections. The first section is records and structs and is comprised of multiple lessons. What is a record or struct? It's a way of grouping related fields into the same data structure. A common simple way of doing this is using the built-in dict type, a dictionary, in order to do this kind of grouping. If you want or need more control than that, you can start using some of the object-oriented features of Python, but that often means an awful lot of extra code. The data class concept provides a shortcut for writing classes requiring less boilerplate than if you were just doing it normally. And the last record that I'll talk about is from the struct library. The struct object is a way of grouping C type fields together. This can be useful if you are working with network data, binary data, or interacting with a Python extension that uses the C language. Once I've covered all these concepts, there'll be an additional lesson on how to choose between these different implementations and where to get more information. The second section is on sets. A set is an unordered collection of unique items. Python provides two built-in types to do this kind of work. The first is called set and the second is called frozen set. These are the mutable and immutable versions respectively. A close cousin to sets is sometimes called a bag. In the collections library, the counter object performs this need. Like a set, it's a collection of unique items. Unlike a set, it tracks how many times you put in each unique type over and over again, keeping a counter, hence the name of the object. Next up, I'll start the first section and dive into records. In the previous lesson, I gave an overview of the course. In this lesson, I'm going to start the first section on records, structs, and data transfer objects, starting with dictionaries, tuples, and classes. The purpose of record data structures is to group together fields that are related. This is sometimes known as a struct or a data object. Some programming languages like C actually have struct as a keyword to do this kind of grouping. Frequently, when you're dealing with databases and ORMs, or object relational models, these kinds of records map directly to the contents of a table in the database. This makes sense because whether you're talking about a record or a class or a dictionary or a table in the database, you're usually trying to group together fields that are of the same purpose. If I'm describing a person and I need to know their first name, their last name, and their address, then there's a table or an object named person, and it has fields for the first name, last name, and address. All of these things can be considered records and really just different ways of storing those records, either temporarily in memory or permanently on disk, like in the use of a database. A quick and convenient mechanism for creating this kind of relationship in Python is to use the built-in dict type as a dictionary, grouping fields together for a record. Consider this dictionary. The car one object has three fields, the color, the mileage, and a Boolean dictating whether or not it's automatic. Fundamentally, this is a record. There are pros and cons of using a dictionary. Because it's a built-in type for Python, it's actually been quite optimized, and it's a convenient way of quickly putting something together. The fields themselves are dynamic, and that can be a bit of a problem. 
that means there's no type checking. If I put in color colon pi, it'll allow it. There's no field name checking. This in itself can also be a problem. If you want to add a field that isn't supposed to be there, it lets you. There's also no way of indicating mandatory fields. I could create another dictionary for car2, forget the color, and then have my program throw an exception when I go to use the color of car2. And finally, spelling errors can cause tricky to find bugs. Personally, I come from one of those countries that spells color differently than what's in that dictionary above. It would be easy for me to introduce a bug by accidentally spelling color with a U and causing the code not to find the actual color field. These kinds of bugs usually aren't found until runtime and typically are found because of a key error being thrown. The dictionary isn't the only built-in type that allows you to group fields together. If you need an immutable record, a tuple can work. Each position in the tuple would correspond to a field in the record. You have to be careful with this though. Two tuples of the same length don't necessarily have the same fields. My first tuple could have color and number, and my second tuple could have number and then color, and those aren't going to work together. The collections library has a function that is a factory for a type of class called a named tuple. This allows you to create tuples where each of the positions in the tuple corresponds to an actual field. This makes attribute access cleaner and more obvious in your code. So if you need an immutable record, the named tuple is one way of tackling this problem. The object-oriented aspects of Python allow you to create classes to group things together. Using a class is a little more formal than a dictionary, but it still has some of the problems the dictionary has. For example, there's no way to prevent the addition of fields for a class just like there isn't in the dictionary. The default wrapper method of a class is pretty useless and doesn't give you very much information, so you need to override that if you're going to write a good class. So that's more work that you have to do if you're going to use a class as a record. Classes do support the property decorator, so you can create the concept of a read-only value. So if that's important to you, this is a feature that you can't do with a dictionary. So there's more control here, but a lot more work that you have to do to get it going. Typically, classes are only used if you're going to include business logic in methods. They don't tend to get used as plain data objects. Let me show you an example. car.py defines the car class. Inside of the constructor, you can see the three fields that I intend to use, color, mileage, and automatic. Notice that I'm casting each of the fields into the type that I'm expecting to come in from the constructor. By doing this, I'm guaranteeing a certain degree of type safety. It's not perfect, but it's better than nothing at all. I don't guarantee that what you pass in in the color field is actually a color, but I can guarantee later on that when I go to use it, it'll be a string. I'm doing something else with the mileage field as well, and that's the leading underscore. Python has no concept of public or private members of a class, but by convention, anything with a leading underscore isn't meant to be publicly exposed. By putting the underscore here, I'm indicating to other programmers that I don't intend for others to be using this field directly. And the reason I've done this is because this class supports different ways of getting at the fuel economy of the car. Inside of the MPG property, it uses the underscore mileage field directly. Inside of the kilometers per liter property, I convert mileage into kilometers per liter. Both of these are ways of measuring fuel efficiency. And by using this underscore on mileage, I'm indicating to other programmers that they should be using the MPG or kilometers per liter properties instead. Finally, in this class, I'm overriding the double underscore wrapper method. The default one for a class gives you very little information. Instead, I want to print out information about the class itself. The convention in Python is to have your wrapper method return a string that if it were run in the REPL would create the object that you are currently using. I'm constructing a new car with the color, mileage, and automatic values of the current object. Let me show you the use of this inside of the REPL. First, I'll import it. Now I'll create a car. And if I examine the object, I'll see what comes back from the double underscore repair method. 
There it is, a red car that gets 25 miles per gallon and is automatic. The type casting mechanism that I used inside of the constructor gives me a certain amount of type safety. Let me show you this in practice. The second field is expecting a float. When I pass in a string, that string can't be cast to a float, and so I get a value error. Python is a dynamic language and provides no mechanism for preventing the addition of new fields. You can do this simply by adding a field to the object. Notice this has no effect on the wrapper. The wrapper prints out just those fields defined in double underscore wrapper. I can, though, get at the field. Now let's look at those properties. First, miles per gallon, and second, kilometers per liter. Just like the example I gave in the dictionaries, spelling errors can cause you problems as well. If I attempt to directly manipulate the mileage field, but forget the underscore, it has absolutely no effect on the MPG. Now car one has both underscore mileage and mileage as fields. This is one of the downsides of Python being a dynamic language. You can shoot yourself in the foot doing these kinds of things rather easily. Finally, to emphasize the importance of overriding that double underscore wrapper method, let me create a quick class to show you what you would get if I hadn't. There's the class bike. I've created a bike. And that's the output of the default double underscore wrapper. Not particularly helpful. In the next lesson, I'll show you the data classes shortcut that allows you to remove a bunch of the boilerplate I just demonstrated, the name tuple object, and structs.